the point of work isn't simply to get a paycheck. And the point of you reading a lot of books isn't so you can update your Goodreads list and have all of us think that you're really smart. And the point of marriage isn't simply to have a spouse on paper. And you guys do know the point of children isn't to get the tax credit. And the point of church isn't simply Sundays, and the point of life isn't merely to exist, and the point of following Jesus isn't so that we get to go to some place called heaven when all of this is over. You know, regardless of the topic we're talking about, it's so easy for us to miss the point, isn't it? It's just so easy to miss the point of it all. As we continue to follow Jesus through the Gospel of Mark, you're going to see a couple of audiences today who completely miss the point. And when I show you how they miss the point, you're going to think, how could they miss the point? But I think after some self-reflection, I think all of us will go, wow, how do I keep missing the point? Anybody tired of missing the point of life, of faith, of Jesus, of spiritual practices, of marriage, of church? No surprise, but I'm calling this message, don't miss the, yeah, if you have a Bible on you in any shape, form, or fashion, Mark chapter 2, verse 23, uh, we'll look at two scenes, the, the, the end of Mark 2, the beginning of Mark 3, so through 3, verse 6, I want to ask you to stand with me, and just today, I want you to go into this, go ahead and stand. We're going in asking the question, how might I be missing the point, but we want to go in with a commitment out of that question, which is this, God, give me the resolve not to miss the point of whatever you're teaching us today. Just go ahead and ask that question. How might I be missing the point? And then, God, would you give me resolve to make sure that I don't miss the point you have for my life, for my practices, for my relationships? Verse 23 of Mark 2, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is, key word there, unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is, key word, lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he, Jesus, said to them, the Pharisees, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Chapter 3, another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man was there with a shriveled hand. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Like, he better not. He better not. Verse 3, Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them a great question, key word coming, which is lawful, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill. But they remained silent. The people who are always calling Jesus out when he probes the heart, nothing. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. It's so easy to miss the whole point. Let's have a seat and make sure we don't. And you're already thinking, and you should be thinking, how do the Pharisees get this so wrong? Like, how in the world could they have a problem with the things we just saw in the text out of both scenes? Before we talk about what the Pharisees get wrong, let's start with what they get right. Let's give them a little bit of credit. Here's what they get right and what you and I need to get right. The Sabbath is a big deal to God. The Sabbath's a big deal to God. They understood that part right. It's really important. Did you know that out of all the spiritual disciplines, out of all the spiritual practices that exist, only the Sabbath shows up in the Ten Commandments? Did you know this? Think about this. Only the Sabbath shows up in the Ten Commandments. Prayer doesn't show up in the Ten Commandments. It's important. 
Fasting does not show up in the Ten Commandments. A quiet time does not show up in the Ten Commandments. Scripture reading does not show up in the Ten Commandments. The only spiritual practice that shows up in the Ten Commandments is the Sabbath. Look at it in its original word from God in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Listen closely. God says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now in Deuteronomy 5, you get the Ten Commandments one more time. And the commandment about Sabbath, it's almost the exact same wording as Exodus 20, but I want you to see the one distinction out of Deuteronomy 5, verse 15. In Deuteronomy 5, 15, here's the difference. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, because you were liberated, because you were freed as slaves, The Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. The Sabbath is super important to God, and he wants it to be super important to his people. But as humans tend to do, the Pharisees took it too far. Just so we understand, the Sabbath, that word, it literally means to cease, to desist, to stop. To cease, to desist, like just Stop. Again, the Sabbath is a really big deal to God, but it's not a big deal to God for the reason the Pharisees thought. The Pharisees thought it was a big deal to God because of religion, because of regulation, because of compliance. And they thought it was their duty to make sure they hold it up and enforce it and build all this stuff around it so it becomes the standard they set for everyone around them to follow. That's what they're going for. But it's almost like they forgot the intention of the Sabbath. It's almost like they missed the point of the reason by which God gave them this command to observe the Sabbath. At the end of Exodus 20, verse 11, it says that the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. I'm about to give you my favorite quote I came across while I was preparing for this message. It is huge, it is significant, and I want you to understand what God intends when he says to bless and make holy. Here's what the commentator said. He wrote, in brief, bless is the language of giving, while made it holy is the language of claiming. I love that. Bless is the language of giving, while made it holy is the language of God claiming something for himself. When something is blessed by God, it becomes a vehicle of his generous giving and an expression of his warm concern. When God declares something holy, oh, I love this, he claims it for himself, taking it out of ordinary circulation and declaring it special. Anybody like that besides me? Bless, the language of giving, made holy, the language of claiming. So when we say, I want to live a holy life, or when Peter writes, copying the Old Testament writers, be holy, God says, as I am holy. He's saying, let God claim your life like he wants to claim your life. Let, 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 let God bless your life with this general, generous giving that he wants to pour into your life. And it's interesting that the Pharisees missed the point. They didn't understand what bless and make holy meant. They thought, yes, make holy means that you have to be perfect, and the law was everything for them. We'll come back to that in just a moment. The Pharisees came up with 39 things that were forbidden for you to do on the Sabbath. 39 things that were forbidden to do on the Sabbath. Think about the irony. Don't miss this. You don't miss the point just because they did. Think about the irony. God gives Sabbath as something to lift his people up. Pharisees use Sabbath as something to weigh his people down. Don't miss this. It's not just that they missed out of it. They literally inverted the purpose for which God gave the Sabbath to them. They made it a burden. They made it a standard that no one could live up to. Let's ask this question. Why make Sabbath a burden if the whole point of it is to remember that you were freed by the work of God? 
I wonder what do we make a burden to carry out in our lives when God's entire intention behind what he gave to us is freedom? Why make Sabbath a burden if the whole point of it is to remember that you were freed by the work of God? The Pharisees completely miss the point, don't they? And this makes Jesus angry. This makes Jesus angry. They miss the point and Jesus is angry. Now, if you read through the four Gospels, You will not see Jesus angry all that often, but we see Jesus angry right here. Why? Because the Pharisees took the gift of God and they turned it into something that doesn't represent the heart of God whatsoever. They took what was intended to be gift, joy, rest, remember, freedom, and they turned it into something that isn't recognizable as coming from God's heart whatsoever. Now notice the, the word play here from Jesus. Guys, Jesus is not only God in the flesh, he's the most brilliant human who has ever lived. Seth and I talk about this a lot, don't we? Dallas Willard, great author, who wrote a lot of stuff that's over our heads, but we can understand a lot of it. And we're always talking about something that Jesus said, and one of the things we will say to each other is like, man, he was so brilliant. He is so brilliant. He he is the embodiment of the greatest of all realities. So Jesus does something with his language here that you need to not miss. Now, if you asked a Pharisee, what do you care about most, they would have told you God. But that's not true. What a Pharisee cared about most was the Starts with an L, ends with an A-W. Yeah, the law. You guys are rocking it, even in your costumes. They cared most about the law. And this wasn't all bad. And I'll talk more about how we missed the point in the other direction. Can I get a witness? They had a legalism issue. We have a I don't even want to do it issue. More on that in a bit. Just stay tuned. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. So they cared most about the law. So they asked Jesus in the first scene, Why do your disciples do what is what? Unlawful. Jesus recalls a scene from David when they grabbed something that was intended for only the priests, and Jesus says that was unlawful. When Jesus and the Pharisees talk about what is lawful, what's the difference in how they interpret it? Here's the difference. The Pharisees care most about the letter of the law. Jesus cares most about the heart of the law. Don't miss this. And then here comes the brilliant wordplay in the second scene. Listen to what Jesus asked those Pharisees. You guys tell me, which is lawful? To do good or to do evil? Again, you guys tell me, which is lawful? To save life or to kill? They knew for sure what the right answer was. But you know how it is when we don't want to admit our guilt? Like, I don't know. The guys who are always brilliant wordplay from Jesus, which is lawful. He uses the thing that they care most about. And today, he might want to use the thing you care most about to reframe how you think about the thing. The Pharisees missed the point. And you're like, Ben, yes, that is pretty obvious. You're right. They allowed their religion to keep them from enjoying the gift of Sabbath. How could they? And you all know, at some point, I'm going to stop talking about the Pharisees and talk about you. Here we go. Is it possible that in a different yet very similar way, we are allowing our 21st century favorite religions to keep us from enjoying God's gift of Sabbath? It's a question for you. It's not rhetorical, but you don't have to answer it out loud. What is your religion that is keeping you from enjoying God's gift of Sabbath? I'll just throw four your way. What is your religion? It could be a different one than these four. Is it the religion of work? Is it the religion of FOMO, that fear of missing out? i got to follow all the people and I've got to do all the things. What happens if I'm not there when it goes down? Maybe for some of you, this is perhaps the religion of always on. And then for others of us, let's dare tell the truth. It's the religion of I'm too important. And if you're like me, you're struggling to identify which of those four because you see all four in you. 
the religion of work, I love producing. The religion of FOMO, I hate missing out. So does she. If you answer and just say live.epicsf.com, it's fire. Fire emoji, not the word. The, fear, uh, the, the religion of always on, I feel more comfortable on than I feel off. And what about the religion of I'm too important? I'm the lead pastor of Epic Church. How's it going to go on? How will lives be transformed? How will we get that taken care of? If I take a day off, how are we, we going to hire the right next team member? How are we going to fund the home initiative? And then comes the Hope Project. And then how are we going to do it? What's yours? February 24, 2019, there was an article in the Atlantic called Workism is Making Americans Miserable. And I want to give you an excerpt from it. What is workism? It is the belief that work is not only necessary to economic production, but also the centerpiece of one's identity and life's purpose. And the belief that any policy to promote human welfare must always encourage more work. The only way to advance human welfare is to always require more work. And it does feel that way, doesn't it? And again, I'm like, no, Ben, I'm orienting my life around Jesus. Or are we orienting our life around culture? Self-included. Self-included. When we forsake the Sabbath, we miss out on God's gift, and we miss out on a significant thread that he's literally woven into the fabric of the universe. Like, guys, it's, it's not just that it's a religious Christian thing to do. It's literally woven into, there's a reason why you let the land rest so that it's more fruitful in the future. There's a reason why you work your tail off. For, now, some of you, if you're not working six days but only two, we got a word for you. That's not most of us, though. Most of us, it's like seven. I got to do seven. And then you're like, Ben, I would do a Sabbath if there were just eight days in a week. And I'm like, you are lying. Right? What would you do with another four hours? Remember, if you go back and read all the research as, they were, as we were heading as a, as a world into the Internet age, we were going to be working 20 hours a week. Why? Because we had all this fast stuff to process now. Anybody's reality? You would not rest on the eighth day or the ninth day if you and I don't know how to rest when we have seven. Stop playing games with yourself. It's because we don't trust. Now, notice what Jesus says in verse 27. Then Jesus said to the whole group, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And in this one sentence, Jesus is showing how the Pharisees missed the point, and he's showing how we missed the point. Just this one sentence. I'm going to give it to you with this principle. Let's embody it. While God did not make us to hold up the Sabbath, he did make the Sabbath to hold us up. With me? It's like, no, Ben, I don't feel like I've got to hold the Sabbath up. I know you don't. You don't feel like you need the Sabbath at all. So we don't have to hold up the Sabbath. But God said, I gave you the Sabbath to hold you up. Can we please go back to talking about those Pharisees? <laughs> I really like how I can point out how they missed the point. In the scene with the man with the shriveled hand, I mean, it, it is mind-blowing to me that the Pharisees lose their mind when it comes to plucking grain and, and Jesus wanting to give a man with a shriveled hand Jesus wanting to give a man with a shriveled hand a restoration of that hand. That's crazy to me. They're, they're losing their minds at that moment. Now what's interesting is remember in Mark so far, you won't get this turning point if you don't think what we've seen so far. You remember in Mark so far, whenever Jesus does something, he tells them to keep it a secret. 
Anybody remember Pastor Will's message besides me? Will, keep your eyes closed, man. You know how this is as a communicator. (laughs) Will taught about the man who was cleansed of his leprosy, and Jesus told him what? Don't go what? Don't go tell anyone. Jesus was trying to keep it small. He was trying to keep it private. He was trying to keep it hidden. And guys, in this moment, Jesus has had enough. So he says to the man, stand up in front of everyone. Stand up in front of everyone. I want them to see that they are missing the point. And he heals the man right there in front of everyone. And he asks that question, and you know the answer to the question, which is lawful to do good or to do evil? Which is lawful to save life or to kill? You're like, Ben, we know the answer. We're better than the Pharisees. If you know the answer, are you practicing the answer? Pharisees had a problem with legalism. We have an aversion to commandments, authority, and obedience. Don't we? Or am I the only person that doesn't like being told what to do? We don't like the have-tos from God. Maybe it reminds us of a stuffy church we grew up in, that you just, you gotta do this, and you gotta do that, and you gotta do that, or you can't even come in. I get that. I want to give you something that if you will embed it in your heart, it will help you live out God's purposes for your life with joy. Huge statement here. I want you to take it in. I want you to write it down. I want you to memorize it. I want you to embed it. I want you to teach it to your kids and other people that you have influence over. Here it is. God requires things from us because he desires things for us. What are the commandments about? What is obedience about? God requires things from us because he desires things for us. When God requires that sex be done only within the confines, the boundaries of a covenant marriage, he's not a killjoy. He created it all, and he wants you to flourish in it and have it be one of the most joy-filled, intimate realities of your life. When God requires us to be generous, it's not so he can pay November's rent. He wants something for you. He knows your mindset being one of abundance rather than scarcity is the best way for you to live. He knows you can't become like Jesus if you never become generous. He knows he needs to free you from a life of selfishness and from the grip of greed. He requires it from you because he desires it for you. And so when he commands, observe the Sabbath, it's not because he wants to take 24 hours away from you. He wants to give you delight and joy and rest and replenishment and restoration. You see, God wants us to keep Sabbath because he knows we need to stop, rest, remember, and be refreshed. Most of us here and watching online, we don't have a withered hand, but we need to know that restoration is still the point of our Sabbath. Restoration is still the point of our practicing the Sabbath. So do we want to keep missing the point? Or do we want to live into the point that Jesus is making? So let's assume that we want to practice Sabbath. How would we go about doing that? The first thing you have to do is super practical but super spiritual. You've got to set aside time for it. You've got to set aside time for it. If you can do a full 24 hours, that would be amazing. If you need two half days, awesome. If you need to start with a half day or a four-hour block, you just need to set aside some time And you need to be, it's like anything else in life, we're more disciplined when we begin it. At some point, it will become second nature. For me right now, I'm utilizing two half days, at least I'm supposed to, just being honest, supposed to. A portion of Saturday and a portion of Monday for me is how I'm trying to make Sabbath happen in my week. But whatever you do, make it a reality to some degree. And I know what you're thinking. Ben, I've got too much on my plate. I know you do. So take some things off your plate, but don't take Sabbath off your plate. I know you know how to remove things from your plate because perhaps you've removed Sabbath from your plate. So put it back on and let's take some less important things back off. I get it. Listen to this quote from a great book called Get Your Life Back from John Eldridge. He writes, what we assume is a normal lifestyle is absolute insanity to the God-given nature of our heart and soul. 
what we keep telling our, it's normal. This is what lead pastors have to do. It's what San Franciscans have to do. It's what people in the West in the 21st century have to do. It's what founders have to do. It's what parents have to do. It's what, I get it. But what we call normal, it's absolute insanity to the God-given way our souls have been shaped. And you've heard me say this before. Everything in our world has sped up over the last 2,000 years, but you know what hasn't changed speeds at all? Your soul. It's not going to change speeds, so we've got to figure something else out. And, you know, most people I talk to, some combination of tired, exhausted, overwhelmed, and busy. And so, if you don't see Jesus' heart on Sabbath, you will assume it's just one more thing. And you'll see it as being added to what I know is a long list already. But what Sabbath does is it sits on a list by itself and it restores you so that all the things that are on the list, they either will come off the list because you'll live with greater clarity or you'll bring an attention and focus and energy to what is on the list, but you'll be reminded, wait a minute, I'm not holding all of these things up. He's holding me up. He's going to hold these things up as well. So what do you do when you get to Sabbath? Once you've set aside the time, let me give you a few quotes from uh, some of my uh, favorite authors on this. Here's one from John Mark Comer. Actually, here's two from John Mark Comer. John Mark writes, If you're new to the Sabbath, a question to give shape to your practice is this. What could I do for 24 hours that would fill my soul with a deep, throbbing joy, that would make me spontaneously combust with wonder, awe, gratitude, and praise? He goes on to write, the Sabbath is how we fill our souls back up with life. Here's one from my friend Rich Velotas. He writes, Sabbath is not just rest from making things. It's rest from the need to make something of ourselves. It's a day of noticing, a day of simple, joyful presence, which is why community and eating together are such good Sabbath practices. It's a day of presence. How does that sound? No, really, how does that sound? Ex- introverts are like miserable. <laughs> Sabbath and how you practice it does have a lot to do with how you're wired. So like from getting to know both of these guys, I know John, Mor- John Mark's Sabbath experience is more introverted. It's more him sitting at a window, right? Shauna is a little more of that, where I'm a little more like rich. I want to be around, th- like doing things, not work but doing fun things. So it really is based on how you are wired. But think about this. Jesus was willing to risk his life so that we wouldn't miss the heart of Sabbath. I just dropped the mic for those of you who are like, yeah, I'm not sure that's a big deal. Guys, Jesus was willing to risk his life. Look at verse 6. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. For what? Because he healed a man with a shriveled hand on the Sabbath? Because they were so betrothed to the letter of the law that they missed the heart of the law? Because they could not imagine a God though their key story and their Israelite history, their key story was that they were slaves in Egypt under the rule and reign of Pharaoh. And their key story, right? When they would celebrate Passover, it was back to that moment. But remember, when they were led out of Egypt and God wanted to take them into the promised land, they kept asking to go where? Let's go back to Egypt. You see, they were familiar with chains. They were familiar with that burden. They were familiar with shackles. They were familiar with 24-7, you better get the work done, and then they would get more work that had to be accomplished in the same amount of time. That's what they were familiar with, and I know what you're familiar with because I'm familiar with it too, but if Jesus gave his life so that we wouldn't miss the heart of Sabbath, we can't just keep going on, going on. And if you look back at the last 10 years, you're like, Ben, we've taught a lot about the Sabbath. Yes, the scriptures teach a lot about the Sabbath, and we either do one of two things as communicators. We teach things that we're really good at, or we teach things that can be a constant struggle for us. 
I'm glad that my practice is more effective than it was a decade ago. But I hope that a decade from now, I'll be able to tell you guys, man, remember when we talked about that in 2021? It got even better. I became even freer. I'm trusting him even more. And I rest well at night, not just on my Sabbath nights, but on every night, because it's in his hands. Either your life is in his hands, or you better get after it. Because if you're going to hold your life up by yourself, I know you're smart. I know some of you are very wealthy. But what I've seen is wisdom, intelligence, and wealth at some point in time will not be enough to sustain you. So why don't we build this habit in now before we get crushed from life without it? Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for the gift of Sabbath. God, thank you that you, God, you have a way in which you draw us to yourself and you draw us into life and you, you remind us of what matters. And God, I confess, and perhaps we all do, that in a different but in some ways very similar way to the Pharisees, we have missed the point. You've been offering us life, and we've been choosing something different. You've built something into the rhythm of the way this universe works, and we have chosen to ignore that. God, forgive me, because I can point to others in the world and say, well, everyone else is doing it, but I'm reminded today, for all of us, you've said, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And God, you use the rhythms you prescribe, like the Sabbath, to help us renew our minds. Jesus, thank you that you are willing to make a big deal of something that is a big deal. Thank you that though you knew it would begin to cost you your life, you knew that if we didn't adhere to the Sabbath, it was going to cost us our lives. And so you risked it all so that we wouldn't have to miss out. Thank you. And if I can have your attention just for a moment, I want to make sure we understand and connect some dots, and then we'll, we'll stand and sing. Guys, Sabbath isn't like just something that's off-center from Christianity. Like, it represents the whole heart of it. You see... If we can't trust God one day a week, we're probably not trusting him the other six. And if we can't trust God with our earthly lives, we probably haven't truly trusted him for our eternity. And today the invitation is, yes, practice Sabbath, but even deeper than that, to put faith in Jesus, to literally say, I trust you. I celebrate what you did to free me from my sin. That's available because he did go to the cross It's moments like we read about today that are going to end up hanging him on a cross. And he's going to keep saying, Jesus, did you mean to go public that soon? Did you really want to stand up the guy in front of everyone and make this scene, knowing what the Pharisees would do? And he's like, yeah, I would do it all over again because I need you to know that when you couldn't lift the sin off your shoulders, I lifted it off. When you couldn't pay the price, I paid the price. When you could not give your life, I gave mine. So yeah, let's celebrate Sabbath, but let's celebrate the reality that we can trust Jesus one day a week and the other six days of the week for this earthly life and for the one that he promised us to come. Let's stand and let's worship.